We have OIT. any buttons on these, right? Thank you. Um, well, they're coming. Um, thank you. We now have OIT. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. State your name for the record. Uh, yeah. Council President, my name is Charles Brennan. I'm the CIO. Um, I have with me senior staff. Uh, I know you have a meeting at 6 o'clock. So if it's okay with the chair, I'll forego uh, testimony. We can go right to questions, if that's okay with you. It's okay with me. Um, I see no opposition from members of the committee. Please proceed. Um, you have a brief summary of your testimony? Yeah, sure. Yeah, just briefly, just sure. kind of go through it. Um, I wanted to talk about a number of things that maybe some of the new council people don't realize that OIT actually performs for the city. Um, for example, uh, uh, we, we do a, a number of social outreach programs in the Key Spots program where we man 19 centers. Um, most, of those, um, uh, most of those centers are in, um, are in uh, minority neighborhoods. Uh, 18 of 19 of our staff there are, are minority mentors for the kids. We also process all the city payroll, which is good news for all of us here. We manage almost 22,000 personal computers and laptops. Uh, we also um, uh, manage the uh, city's video surveillance system. We have 339 city-owned cameras, and we get over 2,700 camera feeds from uh, other agencies. Um, we uh, man channel 64, and which is taking all our pictures right now, and that is now a high-def channel. Uh, we manage over 2,800 cell phones and almost 29,000 landline phones. Uh, we also do much of the city's printing. Uh, we print about 30,000 water bills a day. We also print over 900,000 print pages per month, including W-2s, all letters and reports, things from the mayor, water finance, subpoenas, etc. We operate the city's help desk, where we field over 81,000 requests for service. Uh, one of the most important jobs is, is we, um, we support all the technology in the city's 911 center. Uh, including the uh, city's, city's radio network, which is used exclusively by police and fire, where we have 12,000 subscribers. And last year, we logged 33 million push-to-talks. Uh, OIT maintains the city's technical infrastructure, where, and we uh, process almost 100 million emails for the city every year, and we assist in project management for every major technical project operating in the city. 
So uh, prepared to answer whatever questions we can, Council President. Thank you very much. Got a couple of quick questions. Um, I'm paid for your testimony. It shows you have 385 positions budgeted for FY16. Only 320 of them have been filled so far. Uh, but however, there is a proposed increase in upwards of a 100 million, I'm sorry, $1 million for class 100, even despite these current vacancies. Can you one, tell me about your plan to fill the exi existing vacancies and two, can you tell me why you're asking for an additional um, $1 the, million? Um, we actually have 20 vacancies right now out on the web that we can't fill. And filling vacancies with technical positions has been a perennial problem here. So uh, right now there are 20 out there, uh, largely technical positions. Uh, the, the increase you in cannot fill those positions? Pardon, pardon you me? So you cannot fill those no, positions? No, we, we cannot fill them. They, they've been out there for quite a while. They're um, things like uh, networking um, uh, positions, highly technical skills. Um, our, our salaries are actually fairly good. It's the perks that we can't, we can't make uh, what a private company can give. I think that's where the we- Perks as in bonuses? Well, it's it's it's, kind it's, of it's more than bonuses. Sore actually. subject right about now in the government. Well, no, I don't mean I don't mean bonuses. But if if you see what so, some of the technical firms offer, even those in the city, like for example, one uh, one city business, uh, they have a nap room. Uh, a nap room wouldn't go over well here in the city. Uh -huh. uh, they they let the uh, they have very flexible hours. Uh, they let you work from home. Um, you know, things that the city would really have a hard time doing. So uh, they offer a lot more flexibility in the workplace than we do. Uh, plus they offer things like free food, massages, things like that. So we just can't compete with that. So, um, it, you know, it kind of makes it harder to draw that technical talent. Mm. I know, I, you can use a massage so, about so now, I guess, right? I am so tempted to follow up on that question, but I think, <laughs> I think I'm going to move on on that one. Uh, as, as for the positions where, which we uh, requested increases in, um, we, uh, the, the uh, a one Philly project is putting somewhat of a strain on the people, on my people who do payroll. Okay. Cause, cause one, so we've asked for additional help there because that, that is a really, really difficult project. Uh, we've asked for, when I came here, one of the things that I wanted to beef up was the security, the, the, the security of the information that the city holds. Mm -hmm. I felt that we weren't uh, strong enough there, so we've asked for additional positions in, in uh, security. Um, we've hired, we're gonna hire four positions for, uh, Commissioner Perry just got so off. So is the, the $1 million, that's, the, that's for the additional position? It, it's for, uh, it's for, 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 it's about eight or nine posi additional positions, that's what it's for, for All these right. different things. Let me, let me, is this your, you're, you're new in this position. Were you in the government before? Yes, sir. I was, um, I was actually, I worked for the city for 33 years. I was essentially the CIO for the police department and I started okay. as a police officer here. So you've been around. Okay. I just uh, yeah, sure I kind of know. I kind of know. I just had mad. <laughs> so with respect, so my question is, if you're asked for an additional 1 million, is that for a class of employee that's not currently listed in your unfilled positions? Yes, sir. Okay, so we can't just move that money around? Like you said, you have 20 positions that you need to fill, and it sounds like to me like there's no likelihood that those are gonna be filled? Well, we always, we always have hope. So, yeah. uh, you know, we're always looking. So uh, those, you know, what, what, the, what the finance office does is they budget us for those. So. Actually, you're, you're looking at uh, a January figure. We actually have about 340 people on now. So we have hired a few, but we still have 20 people out there. If you were to look right now, there's, there, we have 20 uh, people that we're looking for. So you have 340 for. instead of 328. Yeah, there's about, uh, that still three, have. yeah, that 328 is a January figure. I and mean, I think we have 342 now, 342. Okay, can the budget director, please step away, I just wanna get a little clarity on the ability to utilize existing positions or appropriations for existing positions to fill positions that we know we can fill and that we need. So Here's are we in a position answer. to fill the positions that we can find people currently or in the next fiscal year, assuming, assuming we will continue to still have uh, positions that funding has been appropriated for but not be able to fill those particular positions? internally without doing a transfer ordinance or anything. Sir, I think I'm... I understand. We have, you tell me you got 20 positions that 
you've been trying to fill for a while, it's mm -hmm. not been successful, it's unlikely that you're going to fill all 20 in the next year. If we need a million dollars to fill positions that we can fill, why can't we utilize the money that's been appropriated for the other positions internally? Sorry, As Anna opposed Adams, to appropriating I'm the, an additional million dollars. I think, think this is to do both. I think it's to, because as you know, we budget by class rather than by position. Right. And so we, and I can pull up the numbers, so we assume a certain number that are filled throughout the year. Um, and we assume. We want to fill that, those 20 positions by then? So I can get you, I, have, I can go and get the budget detail, but we show a certain percentage that we assume within class 100 is filled for each department, and then we have a, a vacancy allowance. And so this assumes during the course of the year we lose people, it takes some time to hire, and then we build that into our projections for each of the department's budgets. And so we don't assume in any department that they are 100% filled throughout the year, and the appropriations is based on that. And so you can see, if you go into the detail, there's a vacancy allowance that we show in each department, and I can go and get it for you and show you exactly how much we're assuming in OIT, but you can see then that we budget by class and not specifically by the number of filled positions, um, and that's how, we, that's how we make sure that they have enough appropriations to hire the amount of people, but also based on what we believe they can get to. And, um, and some departments don't hit that, okay. on it, you know, and we do some work with them about trying to understand can they to, is there a reality check here that they would like yeah, you, all these positions and then they can't a, hire them you got to leave yourself a cushion right and so we allow, we provide some of that um, we work with departments to understand why they're having problems hiring some of them you know it, it varies dramatically by department about why the issues are on their hiring but right. we um, but we do assume there is some vacancies in every department's okay. budget all right now, I know in the old days we used to do that so we can give municipal workers raises, but I was told the other day that we're not doing that this time. But we, we've, we've budgeted in the Civil all, Service Commission for, for, the, for any good. changes. Got, got a quick question um, in anticipation of tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, um, security cameras. You have, your department has involvement in that, am I correct? Yes, sir. All right, so this, this issue about police surveillance cameras and, you know, over the years we hired munices that got screwed up. The whole nine yards, we were supposed to build a network. And I can't seem to get, personally, because I got, personally have an issue because I represent an area that has some real challenges, the cameras. So I had a meeting in part of my district the other night, and I'm not going to say names, but one of the police officials there said, well, we don't have enough people to watch the cameras. So we talked about what happened in Baltimore where they had this process where they had, they called it a football at that particular yeah. time, I don't know what they call it now, where per, a, a person, an officer in a sector car had basically a laptop computer that had, could, had the ability to have access to all the cameras in their sector so they could just punch them up periodically and look and see what's going on in a particular uh, intersection that had some history of drug selling or whatever. And similarly, we saw also where they had um, um, a location in a building uh, in downtown Baltimore where they pulled up every commercial quarter. And I, we don't have that to my knowledge. I just had a meeting with the German town in Erie um, business, Councilwoman Bass and myself yesterday because they want more security cameras in their area. And again, there was this issue about, well, we don't have the person power or we don't have the technology. So as I'm talking, one of the gentlemen in the, in the meeting pulled out his phone and he punched up his store. Mm -hmm. And he said, you can show real time, people were walking down the aisles, he said, yeah, this guy looked like he's getting ready to steal something. I said, well, you don't know that. But anyway, you get my point. He punched up the exterior of the store. So if, what I don't understand, if you can do that on a phone, cell phone, private system, why can't we figure out a way to have more real-time coverage? And I know the police do a real good job in accessing cameras after the fact, but we'd like to be a little more proactive in preventing crime if there is an opportunity to look at real-time. Do we have that technology here to enhance our real-time without increasing staffing levels? If, if you look at how many cameras that we've, we've tied into here, is, is we have, is it 330, 338? 
well, but how many do we own? Three cameras, 339. Yeah, uh, the cameras that the city owns are about 339 cameras, but we tie into 2,700 cameras. So if you add those together, it's like real three, time. Re, yeah, real time. Well, I'll explain not, real time because you know, can, no. Council President, I saw you brought this up last year. I actually watched the I'm testimony. Keep bringing it up. I know you will. I, I know you will. And I, I think I don't think you were given a very good answer last time. Is is the the cameras are real time, but no one watches three thousand cameras. You just okay. can't, right? It, right? Nobody can. And and, it, and, and let me correct. And mo of that twenty something hundred, most of them were SEPTA. But most of them are are cameras other than uh, you know our cameras. There we have SEPTA, we have Penn, I think we have Temple, yeah, we have we have you know all over the city. Right. It's it's really much cheaper to do it that way. Than to keep putting up our own cameras because we we I, might have I'm okay with that right, right we might have funding for like 50 a year and we we kind of go by what the police asked us to do to, to stick those 50 up so we keep adding every year but but as you said and I think you were right on the mark here is they're, they're largely a reactive device you know the the officer who shot in West Philly that, that famous photo that was one of our cameras that caught that right um, so you know to, to watch those cameras the an officer at the at the divic there the delaware valley information center they can actually dial into any of those cameras and look at them so but but the chances of them hitting it exactly when a crime happens is you know probably almost nothing so are you suggesting that if i'm looking at a camera I'm, and, and i don't think we should be using police officers for this by the way yeah. it should be public safety officers which is another conversation for tomorrow and I see a group of guys standing on the corner selling drugs or whatever, then I can't, I shouldn't, I can't proactively say, there's some guy selling drugs I just saw to buy. And they had a police come, you got the camera, boom, case, boom, you can prove no, the it, case. In, in that case, they the actually version. could. In that huh? case, they, they actually could. If the, if the call got to the person who was watching the camera, they could turn that camera on and watch the person. The call it, from the where? Call, well, for example, like a 911 call or somebody were to call yeah, in. I'm not talking about a 911. I'm talking about preventive measures. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to let Ray. If, Ray. I got, if, I, if I have a police officer in a sector car, I yeah. mean, the only reason I'm bringing that because I was, I was sitting in the car. They were driving around. He's pulling up the stuff in every corner in this sector and clearly enhances his ability to monitor a sector. Oh, why don't we do that? Oh, good afternoon. Raymond Haling, Deputy CIO. Uh, I can't talk about the police operations, but I can tell you about the uh, technology infrastructure. Right. Uh, what you spoke about, we can absolutely do. Okay. Um, this is a camera that's on my city-issued phone right now. This is live, real time. Uh, so we do have the capability of doing that. All right. uh, I do know in the past there was some difficulty uh, in terms of... I'm looking, at, I'm lo I'm looking in the front of, front of his house, so... All right. Yeah, and we can do that for just, all. We can actually do that. I just for, want to know about technology from you guys, because right. you're not the police. So we can do that for all of the cameras that we mentioned, all the camera feeds that we mentioned. Uh, we actually have it broken down by district, police district, and that includes a breakdown for all the SEPTA and partner cameras. They're also broken down by district. Um, I'll let the police talk about operations, but they have the capability to roll this out at the district level, right. level similar to what you spoke about. Okay, that's all I need. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, thank you for that information, and I will use that tomorrow when I talk to the police. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilman Heenan. Councilman, I got thank you, Council President. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a. You want me to come up here? Okay. little change of uh, scenery here. So uh, I have a series of uh, Comcast questions I'd like to ask. And first is uh, how, how has the Comcast uh, progressed with the remediation set forth in the agreement? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let um, my chief of staff, Steve Robertson, he's dealt with this from the very beginning, Councilman, so I'd like to have him answer that question. You got it, thank you. Good afternoon. Steve Robertson, Chief of Staff, Office of Innovation and Technology. Can you push the uh, microphone a little closer? How's that? Perfect. Um, right now, um, and to put this in perspective, Comcast's remediation program is, uh, was an 18-month period due to be completed in June of 2017 um, with quarterly inspections 
uh, by the city occurring along the way. The first quarter for inspections just ended on March 31st. Uh, the city is following up with Comcast right now um, in developing a list of randomly selected addresses where they say they've remediated their plant. And there will be an actual field visit to each of those addre addresses and an inspection. So we anticipate a list of addresses to be developed like in the next two weeks. And then uh, beginning late April, late this month, uh, we'll begin the actual physical inspections. Okay, great. Throughout the uh, budget process, if you can, you know, report back to the to the chair, I'd appreciate that on sure. the uh, on the progress. Uh, when can council expect the uh, INET negotiations to be resolved? Uh, it's hard to say at this point. We are actively engaged with Comcast, meeting with them regularly. Um, when the actual terms of that agreement will be finalized, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, we're very close. Um, we're meeting again uh, in the next week with Comcast. Um, we're in the process of exchanging drafts right now, uh, and the last draft came back from Comcast to us about a week ago. So we're reviewing that, and we're already scheduled to meet with Comcast again on uh, April 22nd. Now, the anticipated uh, build-out for the INET is 18 months. Is that correct? Give yeah, that's talk, correct. Yeah. Has any of the uh, any of it started on some of the, uh, I guess, points that you know uh, uh, that are doesn't need to be negotiated? Uh, yeah, yeah, some of the some of the um, some of the programs we're moving on the, the things that have been settled. The only thing really not settled now is the INET. The INET is the one; it's virtually a, um, a contract negotiation. And uh, Councilman, I want to I want to publicly thank you for giving us some information that we were unaware of about the INET. And uh, we've now included your concerns and its concerns of council in our uh, negotiations with Comcast. So I would like to thank you for bringing that to our attention. Oh, we, we appreciate that. Thank you for including council uh, <clears throat> from this point forward. Uh, what is the nature of the city's relationship with Comcast regarding the courtesy accounts uh, that many of our facilities currently are connected to? Uh, I don't know if there's a relationship, but there are quite a few courtesy accounts, mainly in rec centers. The, uh, the rec centers... Uh, What's that? Yeah, they're throughout the city, but many of them are in rec centers. And from what I understood is a courtesy account allowed them to choose a number of different services, whether uh, broadband or video. And uh, so th there are quite a few courtesy accounts, but I don't know how many. Uh, uh, Ray says about 200 throughout the city. About 200 courtesy yeah. accounts. And does OIT control the type of service that can be connected to those sites and the facilities? No. So we don't control. Is is it a managed managed service? It, uh, uh, it it's not done through Comcast? OIT. It's done it's done through the sponsorship of Comcast. Okay, so we don't control the type of service. No. Okay, is there a cap? Do you know on the amount of courtesy accounts that the city can set up with Comcast? Mm, I don't know. There is, and, and Comcast um, included uh, as an appendix to the last, the, the recently renewed franchise agreement, a complete list of all the courtesy accounts, um, and that was their agreement to continue all those courtesy accounts uh, in the in the appendix to the franchise agreement. So but it's it independent from from the INET negotiations. That's correct. And, yes, and, and the, points of connectivity. Yeah, the municipal courtesy, courtesy accounts are are completely separate from what's being discussed now with respect to INET. Because we want to ensure that every public facility has high-speed connectivity and access. Is it, that's what our ultimate goal here is, with you know, through the franchise agreement as well as the uh, courtesy accounts. Is is our our goal is that uh, every city building and the ones that you brought to our attention will have um, have internet access that's appropriate for the size of the building. For example. You know, th this building will have a much different uh, level of service than you know maybe another building that that isn't I mean, as I think large. It's, that kind of it's thing. real. It's real simple. We want we want to have enterprise speed uh, or service and you know uh, fiber connectivity to every public facility in, in uh, the city of Philadelphia, including all our parks and recreations. Uh, has the city done an assessment of, Veri of the Verizon franchise agreement? Uh, yes, sir. Um, Verizon uh, was due to be built out on February 26th. 
have, uh, have you fact checked their, uh, you know, we had a conversation um, with, uh, well, I had a conversation with, with Verizon and, and, and the city uh, and your department. And they, we were supposed to be uh, fact checking, you know, the addresses that they have. Given. Has, is there, has that been done yet? And do you have the results? Uh, yes, we've actually done a little bit more. Our, our consultant, CBG, went out and tested the week of March 14th. Uh, they tested a number of locations randomly to make sure that light was going through the uh, fiber. And that indicates that, you know, video signal could go through it too. All 53 locations they tested came out fine. Uh, they did have some trouble getting to some of the set top boxes uh, and they're resolving those issues. Um, so uh, the, the one issue that remains is that uh, Verizon in fact is not, uh, it has not built out the city to 100%. And if there are some ex exceptions that Verizon can bring up, and we're uh, working with Verizon now to identify what they identify as their exceptions. Okay, so is there a, um, is there a penalty for not being 100% uh, you know, completed you know, with the exceptions uh, that, that's agreed upon you know, within, the, uh, within their agreement? Do you know? Yeah, <clears throat> there are liquidated damages if, um the city cannot verify that they're 100 percent built out after taking into consideration any exceptions that they claim. Okay, so or could you provide the uh, uh, the verifications of all, all you know all they're supposed to do on their bellwether uh, testings sure. and a connectivities because you know, there is a, a large part of the city of Philadelphia doesn't feel that you know that there's competition out there that you know they're able to get into uh, other promotional programs and high speed access sure so uh, if, if we can have a follow up and, and be made aware of that information i'd appreciate it sure not a problem uh, in uh, in your class 200 uh, on page 15 rent the department originally had funded almost ninety five thousand dollars for rent in F fy 16 and is already projecting the obligations will be 545 and some change. And what caused this discrepancy? Chris Donano with OIT. Um, I think that was just a, um, a mislabeling of the class for the prior year. Uh, these are leases that we, we do for the, um, for the PICO. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's a misprint? From the prior year. The current year is correct. So the, yeah, the FY17 budget is is appropriately coded. Okay, and what is that number for 17? Uh, it's about the same as 16, okay. about the 545. Okay, all right. Um, in on page 42, class 200 contract, uh, we are projecting an increase in the city's maintenance contract, city net maintenance contract, when we're expecting the INET to be negotiated and uh, implemented within the next year and a half. Can you explain? During FY17, we'll still have maintenance to pay on, on pieces of the network because the, the INET won't be built out for 18 months, which takes us past FY17. And, and what, what's the term of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the Class 200 contract? Oh, that'll be for the fiscal year. For, so July 1st. Just for, for the fiscal year? Yes. All right. And I want to go back to the previous question on, on rent. You said that the obligations are going to go back to, to 545000 or is it going to go back to 89000 for rent? Let me, let me take another check. It would be page 15. Oh, yeah, my apologies. It'll go back to the, to the lower figure because those rents for, uh, well, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to get back to you. Would you? Yeah. Good, sir. I mean, there's a, an extreme difference. Yeah, the, what we're purchasing, I mean, what we're getting is not uh, different. It's just 
That's fine. If you could just provide the information sure. to the chair, I'm going to uh, yield my time for the next round. Uh, chair recognizes Councilman Dom. And um, from my perspective, I'm going to start off by saying that it's none of, none of your responsibility, but my perspective of the city's technology is really needs a lot of help. I mean, I, I envision a city where on a handheld device, I can tell what properties I own, what properties I'm delinquent on. I can tie in all the tax returns and see what's not paid, what I owe. And that to me is very important. But that's another subject. So let me just get, get to today's budget. You have a $2.5 million decrease in Class 200. I'm just curious what, how come this is being decreased so much, and how do you plan on being able to keep up with the improvement and integration of new technology? The city desperately needs. Is this, is this, is this class, maybe the move of this class to 100 and fill those seats, or why, why are we decreasing this 2.5 million? Uh, so, some of that, Councilman, is a mistake. It was um, inadvertently put into the wrong fund. There was, um, there's two numbers there. The uh, 1 million for the 911 division was put in class 200, and it was inadvertently put in there, so it was taken out. Okay. And then this uh, internal realignment in 911 of 753,000 was put in there. And it, it was taken out, so it shouldn't have been in there in the first place. So it's kind of a deceiving, um, kind of a deceiving drop. Okay, you get that correct and get us. A yeah, copy. Okay. exactly. What's the status of um, Real Time Crime Center? I know we spent three million dollars, I think, on this program a few years ago, and are we using it today? Uh, Raymond Haling, Deputy CIO. Uh, yeah, the Real Time Crime Center went live um, at the Divic back in 2014. Um, so they're fully operational. They're the ones who actually take a look at all the cameras we've been talking about previously. Uh, they also have access to our acoustic anomaly system, which would also be called a gunshot detection system. Uh, but they've been live from a technology standpoint since 2014, I believe, in June. So that's being utilized now? That is correct. Okay. 24 by 7, 365 is my understanding. Okay. And what's the status of the data warehouse? And when do we expect this to be fully functional? Do, do you know that? Um, Hold on, that, that's a capital project, and uh, I've got that here. Hold on. It's a capital. You want to get back to me on that? Yeah, yeah, I will. I will. Okay. Yeah, because we, we, we've really got pages of capital projects going. Let's just get back to me. Sure. The, other, the next question I have is, um, are there any plans to integrate an e-building system? I've talked before at these hearings about water and sewer, real estate tax bills, computerizing that a whole area. Yeah. We're spending like three, four million dollars in postage a year just on sending out water and sewer bills. Are there plans this year to make that happen? Uh, actually, we have an ongoing um, uh, upgrade of the, of the uh, all the revenue sites, uh, all the revenue city websites. Last year, we took in $180 million over, over the web, and our, really our big focus is, is to try to take as much money as we can on the web. Um, actually, a, a few years ago, uh, the only way when you paid a bill on the web, you had to pay that uh, two and a half percent credit card fee, and that kind of, you know, if you were paying a couple dollars, it wasn't a big deal. But trying to pay your property taxes with two and a half percent, nobody would go for that. So the city came around and they made it uh, much easier, charging you a nominal fee to do a debit, and we've kind of seen a big upswing on that. So we are spending a lot of time in the redesign of our of our web functions to make it easier for people to understand where they have to go and how they pay a bill, up to the point, Councilman, where I send people down to the uh, basement of the, of the MSB, you know, where people go and pay the bills, and we actually interview them to find out, like, why they won't go online. You know, why is it you won't go online and pay this bill? So, you know, we're actually doing a lot of work to try to make sure we can get the money in faster. Can you pay real estate tax bills online today? Can you? Uh, I, uh, yes, I actually, actually, uh, when I went in, I looked at the online one, and I could have either paid the credit card or I could have used the debit, which I think cost about, uh, they said it was less than a stamp. So you can pay it, uh, you know, and the debit just pulls it right out of your account. But don't you think probably 75% of the water and sewer bills, which are 400 to 500,000 a month we send out, and the 579,000 real estate tax bills, 75% of those people probably would want to pay online in today's yeah, I, day and age. Yeah, I agree there's a lot that want to pay online, and that's why we're um, in... In, in the redesign of the, of, of the websites, that's why we're spending an awful lot of time on design, and this has never been done before, 
to spend a lot of time figuring out like why people go on the web, what they do there, and how we can make it more friendly for them to go pay their bills online. So uh, if, if you went back a couple of years uh, and we could get these figures, you would see that the number of online payments, the number of e-payments we get go up every year. So we're, you know, I, I, I think we're doing something right here. Can you do me a favor? Can you send uh, this body uh, in writing the plan to computerize the billing for water, sewer, and real estate sure. tax bills? One, can I get one last question? Thank you. Um, what projects are in the works for the next five years to promote the city's tech community and give Philadelphia a presence as a hub for innovation and technology, which is the biggest economic multiplier of jobs we have in our economy, five to one? And what role is the OIT playing in this? Most of our, most of our resources, Councilman, go to the um, uh, go to our customers who are the operating departments. By far, most of our um, uh, role is there. We, we do have a role of outreach in the community, and we do have a role of, uh, we have an innovation section. I have the head of that here, and he might be better prepared to answer that, or we could give you something in writing, whichever you want. I can bring him up. Whatever you prefer. Hi, good afternoon. Andrew Buss good from afternoon. OIT. Uh, we do a lot of work around increasing the capacity for innovation inside government. So we maintain an innovation lab. We also have an innovation fund. And then we have an innovation academy. And the three of those pieces are coordinated to um, really give the most benefit. We also have a lot of work kind of externally around public computing centers, so digital inclusion work. And that was the key spot program that was mentioned earlier. Okay. In addition, do me a favor because out of respect for time, just send it to us in writing. Of course. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilwoman again. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, so I just wanted to follow up on the answer to Councilman Dom's inquiry, uh, you mentioned that you went and interviewed a bunch of people about uh, why they didn't pay online. What was their answer? Um, many of them don't trust that the, that the uh, payment will actually get where it's supposed to get. Uh, the people who tend to go to the uh, MSB, the basement, you know, the, where the cashiering is, where they actually pay, they, they would tend to be uh, maybe not the most computer illiterate uh, of our citizens. So they feel more comfortable and actually giving money to a human being and getting a receipt right there. So, um, you know, so uh, that, that seemed to be, uh, you know, one of the primary reasons that, uh, that people wouldn't go online. That they didn't trust the system or that they well, didn't Well, that they didn't trust the money to... would actually, you know, get there. So they, so a lot of them uh, either, either want that receipt, they want that, you know, interaction with a human being. Uh, they, uh, if you think about it, they didn't even use a stamp. So they, they are, are a little even wary about putting it in an envelope and send it into the city. So, that, you know, that seemed to be one of the primary reasons anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and do you feel like that's a pretty comprehensive look or is that just anecdotal and that kind of thing? Well, they, uh, I had a group of people uh, go down and they interviewed uh, a, a number of people. And the, the purpose of the interview, Councilwoman, is to find out you know, how we can design the website to make it more friendly. Um, if, if you've seen some of the, if you've seen some of the websites, like you, you wouldn't even know how to pay a bill. You'd have a real hard time. Mm -hmm. So the idea is we are putting an awful, awful lot of time and expense in design up front um, so that we can, uh, you know, not have to go back to it later on. So that, that's part of our project. We call it the Alpha Project, and we're spending a lot of time doing that. Okay. Um, uh and then I think I'm going to follow up with a conversation that we had about the at the capital budget, which is a little bit more information about the Digital Alliance Fund. Um, we talked a little bit about um, the importance of the fund in terms of closing the gap uh, for the digital the digital gap for our most vulnerable citizens. And we had a brief discussion about the board and who would actually sit on this and how we can assure that there's diverse representation of communities that are committed to actually uh, increasing digital access and ending, and ending the gap in, um, for, for diverse communities. Um, and you had mentioned that the, the, uh, currently the fund is looking to seat only donors. Is that still true? 
No, no, not uh, not necessarily. We um, uh, we we uh, you know we have some recommendations for the board. We were we were looking for donors to sit on the board, but we were looking for a fairly diverse group who could uh, you know would advise how fairly that money would. Fairly diverse or diverse? No, no, you know a, a diverse. I mean, group. it's either one or the other. I'm sorry. It's I don't. Is there such a thing as fairly diverse? I mean, I'm hoping for a diverse group. Okay, I'll use the language diverse group. Okay. You know, um, you know, but but the, the 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 one of the main goals was is that if once that money runs out, if we can't get more money in, then there would be nothing left. So that was the reason for, you know, having uh, some donors on that group. Um, well, the purpose of the funds board, though, is to determine how to use, utilize the money. Correct. Okay. Um, but that is wholly separate from how the money comes in. Is it your belief that donors would only donate to the fund if they could determine what, how the money was directed? I think it would help. Do you see any conflict of interest with that? No. Really? You don't see any conflict of interest with, with having that, that level of engagement? Here, here's what I think is likely to happen is – Yes, we're going to have the Comcast of the world and the Verizons of the world and the AT&Ts of the world on there, but they're kind of offset one another. I, I don't think they're necessarily going to push things to their own business. I don't think that's going to happen because everybody else on the board probably wouldn't allow it. So, uh, I, you know, and I, what kind of representation from donors would you expect as a percentage of the of the board? Uh, actually, I don't think we know yet because we've we've made some. Um, actually, Comcast reached out to try to get. Uh, some of their competitors on the board for the, for the purposes of donating more money. So the, they've done some of the work. Um, we, uh, we are looking for board members too, and we're looking for uh, input as to who those board members should be. How can we ensure that there is diverse representation of communities on that board? Um, I think we have a – I'm going to let Steve talk, uh, mention this because I think there are, there are a couple other entities on the, that we recommended for the board. Now, the board's not set yet, and of course that's up to the mayor. It's not up to us. We can only make uh, some recommendations, but I think Steve could tell you some more people on the board other than the companies that we recommended. Hi, Councilman. Hello. Steve Robertson, Chief of Staff, OIT. Um, I think what you, what you heard uh, CIO Brennan discuss initially was kind of what we envision would be corporate membership. Obviously, we would like to um, entice uh, uh, corporations within the city to participate, particularly telecommunication providers. Um, but we also envision uh, nonprofit membership uh, on the board itself. Um, we've had in mind the um, People's Emergency Center, Media Mobilizing Project, uh, any, other, any other entities, nonprofit entities that um, anybody would like to suggest. Uh, the composition of the board is actually, um, you know, still developing. Um, so we're looking actually for stakeholders, uh, other entities to, to join that board. And do you see those other entities as being kind of like an addition or a supplement to an existing board? Because it feels like the community end of it feels a little bit kind of uh, secondary in terms of priority. Like I would, I would assume that there would be a good list, a robust list that OIT already had, having been familiar with the importance of this fund, how hard people fought for it, that there was a lot of active groups at the table. There are a lot of groups that are committed to ending the digital gap in this city. Um, and it's, it's just hard to believe that you only can recite two groups right now off the top of your head. No, I mean, we actually still uh, uh, envision additional actually government membership that deal with some of the, the entities that you're talking about. Um, I'll give you a, a couple more examples. The, uh, the Mayor's Office of Community Empowerment and Opportunity uh, is very interested. Um, we also see a, a educational membership, uh, any of the universities that want to participate, if they have a representative that they want to seat on the board, we actually anticipate that happening and we'll certainly invite them. Um, any foundation membership. A um, couple of examples of foundations within the city, the Knight Foundation, the Philadelphia Foundation. And to go back to kind of what I thought was a question uh, that you, you had in there originally, um, we don't see those other members as kind of a subset of, of the board. We see them as actually fully seated members of that, that alliance. I meant and in terms of representation that they would represent a very small portion of the board. I mean, my hope would be that this is a board that truly reflects the diversity of the city that is committed to reducing um, or ending, actually, the digital gap for communities who are most vulnerable. And one of the problems that we often have is that when we create these new funds about people 
um, you know, trying to end inequity in our city that we only see people who actually don't have a problem with, with inequity. And too often the groups that feel the most gap and the biggest, in, you know, lack of access are treated the are, are often on the margins or a small subset of a larger group that's dominating this. One example is like if we are trying to find out why people cannot get online or won't get online or don't trust the online experience, then it might help to have some of those folks be fully represented and that doesn't always happen. I think that donors, funders and others have found ways to, to get to the table. They have great access to a lot of people in city government. It seems hard to imagine that there needs to be another table for it. It doesn't mean that I would exclude them. It just means that the people who are fighting to get to the table, especially on this issue of digital inclusion, have a hard time doing that. And I don't want to create another round table where they are incidental or a tiny subset and that communities, especially black, Latino, immigrant communities, um, language access, groups with high language access needs aren't going to be fully represented in the biggest effort that we have right now, um, though it's, you know, not for the fullest amount, but. If you have recommendations, uh, you know, we kind of struggle with this a little bit, but if, if council has recommendations, we would be more than happy to take them and, and put them on the list for the mayor's consideration. And I would hope that to some extent this becomes a very fully vetted, you know, kind of process that people feel confident about the board. Um, it's really important that this board that's been using this kind of money is seen as being, um, you know, fully uh, aware of, conscious of, connected to the communities that have been fighting so hard to make sure that we end the digital gap. Right. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. And <clears throat> obviously it's the people on the board that are going to make it, you know, whether it's successful or not. And, uh, you know, whether the money is spent wisely. So it's going to be up to the people on the board. So really, if council has recommendations, we, uh, we obviously don't know as much as you do about maybe the, the types of groups that should be involved. So we are more than happy to include whatever groups you feel should be part of this board. Um, and then second question is, uh, could you just talk a little bit more about the implementation for the Comcast franchise agreement around CTE and apprenticeship programs? Where we are with it, what the time frame is, who's working on it? Um, yeah, I, I can take that one. Uh, OIT is not directly involved in the implementation of that. Um, the Mayor's Office of Education is involved directly with Comcast. So they're handling the CTE apprenticeship aspect. Of That's it. correct. They're working on it. There's a there's an identified Comcast representative who's working directly with folks in the in the mayor's office of education, uh, who's working with the school district on CTE. Okay. I will wait for the next round. Thank you, Councilwoman. Chair recognizes Councilman Taltenberger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in, in last year's budget, Mr. White, uh, I believe the department was appropriated funds to upgrade the revenue department's database. And what is the status of that project? The revenue department's database. Do you know? Oh. Yeah, we 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 actually call that something different. There's a there's a tax data warehouse. Um, <clears throat> That project is ongoing. We're predicting February 17 for go live. We have a vendor. Um, so so we, we are under contract with the vendor and that project's uh, being worked on right now. Um, do you believe at this point as it's ongoing, do you believe more funds are needed or do you think the funds that were allocated are adequate? But right now for that particular project, we're okay as of right now. Because I, I really believe it's a critical priority. Uh, my colleague, Councilman Dom, has been really uh, speaking out very, very forcefully and eloquently and getting, us, uh, getting this, this council also very excited about EITC tax credits. What bothers is, it, me is that we simply, that we can't simply search our own revenue tax database and find out who would qualify to have direct contact with these citizens. I know other cities uh, on our scale have these capabilities, and we are still working with the database started in the, in the 1980s. If you could give me a uh, deadline for when you think this project will be completed, well, this might be the project we just talked about, but if that fits into that, 
I think it's rather important. Would that would that be the same project yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're talking about? You're, you're exactly right, Councilman. Is is that the, the the problem that the city has is that many many of the systems are really old and they do date back to the 80s, and they were the ones that were targeted the most for uh, capital upgrades. And this particular one, this uh, tax delinquency database is going to, for, for the first time, let the city mine data, do a lot of analytics on data, and actually be able to target, um, you know, uh, those, uh, those accounts that are most likely to pay off, you know? Like right, right now, they, they don't have that ability now. It's, I mean, the stuff is really, it's, it's mainframe, pretty, pretty old stuff. Okay. So we are, right now, we're targeting February 17 for that right now, and so far that target seems to be holding. I mean, uh, the reason I'm so passionate about the EITC grants are really a great vehicle helping a lot of folks get on that road out of poverty. Those extra dollars can yeah. make a great deal of help for them personally and really for the city as a whole. Yeah. So that's why I believe it's so critical. No, I, I agree with you. It is, and I'm glad to use that word because there, there, are, uh, there are a lot of projects that are very important to the city, but there are projects that are critical to the city. And many of these projects that we have in a capital funding, they, these are things that really have to get done. Uh, you heard your Commissioner Perry, he talked about Eclipse. Right. Eclipse is like absolutely a critical system for them to get up and running, and we're working hard to, to try to you know, solve some of his problems because of all the problems with L&I. He, he's going to have to rely very much on technology to help him do his job. So there's another critical system, and they're not the only ones. There's a bunch of them. Okay. Mr. White, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. On page 43, uh, at the bottom, uh, the bottom code there, there's a miscellaneous expense in uh, uh, FY17 expense for $752,000. Uh, TBD. I, I usually associate TBD yeah. with a scheduling uh, Chris uh, thing, but not uh, at, you know almost a million bucks. Yeah, most of those funds are um, actually uh, the, this class right here is for services. Um, we used to use these funds for services. We actually want to use them for purchasing supplies and equipment. So we're working with the budget office actually get this money. Uh, moved into the appropriate classes uh, during the budget process here. So, so, so at what point will we know what the, the what we're purchasing? The product, the equipment. It's network equipment, telephone equipment. That those are the big two. Uh, specifically, Ray Hailing, WCIO. Uh, specifically, that money is actually being asked to move down. In the past, uh, with the video surveillance system, we used to actually contract out all of the work. Uh, over the last four years, we've actually brought all of the work in-house, so we no longer need services. We actually need the cameras, the fiber, the switches to actually get the camera set up and running. That's really why the request for the transfer. Okay. It, it makes sense. It would be helpful instead of having a, a, a TBD, you want know, a miscellaneous uh, uh, line item that the, it's itemized. If you could please, you know, present to the chair uh, at the appropriate time during this budget process, just, you know, what the itemized expenses are. It, it would be helpful, I think, to sure. a lot of members that are, you know, going thoroughly through this budget. Um, in FY16 budget hearings, OIT mentioned that we're focusing it on a new procurement system. All right. How has this system been developed and what type of advance can we, advancements can we be expecting? Um, I think that's a capital. And what, most important, what should the user expect yeah, to see? Sure. And when sure, will sure. it be rolled out in addition? Um, th this is going to make it uh, much easier to move. Uh, as you know, uh, and I know it's been testified to, the procurement process in the city is pretty, pretty bulky and pretty cumbersome. It's going to have a, a front end for vendors that they can get far more information. Vendors will be able to register now and be able to get notifications uh, automatically. Um, I know the city's looking to a uh, reverse bid auction type of thing uh, to get lower prices. So the whole technology will be uh, used to streamline the procurement system now, which is, um, uh, you know, just, just kind of a very, very difficult process. So it'll be used for services, supplies, equipment, public works, and concessions will all be part of the process. That's ongoing. Uh, it's about a million three, and uh, we're predicting <coughs> fall of 16 for that to be finished. Fall 15, okay. 16, so I'm sorry. You'll be, 
updating council on the progress, or could you? Sure. Maybe I should, uh, I absolutely, should state it that way. Absolutely. You know, because I think you know, several members, and we've been in conversations with, uh, uh, you know, with with the administration, uh, you know, just on our interest in trying to uh, streamline things, make it a lot more accessible and user friendly, much more competitive, and dissuade the efficiencies and the <clears throat> the advances, you know, that we're trying to achieve are actually going to you know come to fruition. We, we are really anxious in trying to make it better for people to do business with the city. Uh, that is really one of our major goals here. So uh, I'm glad we're, we're very much aligned with you, Councilman. Great, great. Uh, what can Council expect from Philadelphians or Philadelphians expect from the OIT in pushing innovation, the innovation agenda with the city? And the only reason I mention is because I'm concerned a little bit that, um, you know, it's not much. Uh, mentioned, you know, through program, uh, programmatic developments, uh, you know, especially since over the last several years, you know, we've been nationally recognized and locally recognized with partners in the private tech community and community groups as well, uh, and the city, you know, recruiting, you know, innovative and creative, uh, you know, you know, entrepreneurs and in, in, in the tech community working for city government, which I think is great. Uh, are, are we going to continue that moving forward? Uh, y yes, Councilman. As, as Andrew Buss, uh, who was up here a little while ago, he's in charge of our innovation section, and he mentioned the uh, Innovation Academy, which, which we, uh, we used to farm out, actually, and we're thinking, uh, we're working with uh, my boss now to kind of bring that in-house because we pretty much know what was taught and be able to actually spread that to more city employees for, for a cheaper cost. Uh, we have the Innovation Lab, which is uh, up at the MSB on the 16th floor. If you've never seen it, it's a, it's a pretty modern, high-tech um, uh, space there where we would do some of the training. So, uh, you know, we're trying to – and just so you realize that all these projects – and, you know, I have this two-page list. There's $120 million of projects here that are being done. Whenever we go out and look at a project, we look – we look for the, the most, uh, you know, the best way to implement the project, and we look for any innovative solution that we can find to, to get the project in to help the customers that we have, which are the operating departments. And that's going to be across all levels of management in, in city departments? It, well, it's, Or is, is that the it, intent? Well, we, we actually service uh, just about every department in the city. All, of, course, of course, all the big ones and even the little ones. And they come to us for, um, for systems, basically. That's what they always come to us for. Everybody wants a system to solve a problem. And uh, what's been nice about the, the uh, consolidation effort that was done a few years ago, if, if, if you look at what it was, the city was 10 years ago, everybody was kind of independent, going on their own way. Now we have competent project management, which we use to hold an agency's hand from inception of idea all the way through the finish of the project. So we even hold our hand through contract negotiations, through RFP building, through requirements gathering, everything. And, and I think that uh, I have a, a lot of bright, smart people working for me. And believe me, we look for every innovative way to make things easier for government and to save money for the city. Great. And, and eventually solve complicated problems. Yes, sir. To produce, you know, what, what we're supposed to be on the, on the, on not just the back end, but the front end for, for the citizens. All right, so I hope and encourage that that continues because I think not just in the systems, it's the people. So we kind of, you know, keep our employees uh, engaged, a part of, it's great for morale, and all, ultimately we have a, a product that we can be proud of. Chair recognizes Councilwoman Blondell Reynolds Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. I was trying to. <laughs> It's been a long day. I, I respect that. I was uh, trying to follow the line of questioning offered by uh, my colleague, Councilman, Councilwoman Gim, and I'll be quite candid with you and letting you know that whenever I hear the word diversity, both ears perk up. So um, I thought I, I heard, and I tried to take my note, you say we struggle with that. So just elaborate on, on what, that, what that is. Um, I'm not sure the context. I, I believe it was she was raising um, my personal opinion, important questions around the diversity of the board and, and et cetera. And um, your, your uh, 
response was that we struggle with that. So I, I'm trying to get my arms around what that means. Oh, okay, okay. No, no, I, I, I remember. Is that uh, what, what the council was talking about is, is you know, she felt maybe that, uh, I know she's gone now, but, uh, you know, I know she felt that maybe we didn't have representation representation on the board that was maybe inclusive of maybe all the groups in the city. Yes. The, the, and, the, and the problem I think we have in OIT is we know a lot of the technical players. Okay. Like we know the Comcast of the world and the AT&Ts and the Verizons. That's who we deal with every day, right? Of course. It's the, it's the, it's the groups that maybe, are, you know, you are better, you know, aware of that we are not, mm -hmm. that, that we struggle with. So that, that's why I said that if council, you know, can, can give us an idea of groups that might be better representative of the of the board, you know, we, we're glad to take those groups because that's where we struggle. We just don't know everyone out there that maybe you do. Okay. Your, your ask for help is very much appreciated and uh, know that we, we will do the follow through. So help me with the completion of this assignment. How many people are on the board? What type of expertise are you looking for the board? What is the current demographic makeup of the board? The, 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 there's actually no one on the board yet. It, I mean, this is, this is uh, the, the board councilwoman come out of the Comcast agreement. Okay. And it requires us to uh, give a conceptual idea to Comcast as to what a digital alliance board means. So okay. it, really, it really is very fuzzy as to what it means. I see. So uh, what we did is we wrote up a, um, a kind of a concept that it would be a board that would be created to decide how the money would be spent. And mm -hmm. the money is half a million dollars from Comcast. And as to what it's to be spent on, again, it's very fuzzy. It talks about digital inclusion, whatever that means. Which is, which is quite nebulous. Right, exactly, exactly, as to what it means. So um, what, 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 what we were saying is, is there's, there's another provision here that we were very concerned about, is that half a million dollars sounds like a lot of money, but y you know that that could go in a heartbeat. You know, so from our point, we were very anxious to make sure that the, their money keeps coming in. So we were looking more at like who can give us money, and maybe not as much about um, you know, you know, maybe your concerns. That's why I asked for your help. Is mm -hmm. that is that the you know the, the the board you know once it's established and there's really no one on the board right now, okay. so it's still being established. That, that clarity that, is important. Yeah, right. That that's why you know we can use the your help because exists right. To so. Help. Frame out. You, you, you could kind of help us okay. by telling us what groups that you know you think might be best represented on the board to to address the problems of digital inclusion. Because what we see the board doing is identifying uh, areas that the money will be spent on. Okay. Right. So that's what we. It'd be kind of giving out like a grant. That's what we think. Is this a half a million dollars annually? No. One this is one no. shot. Yeah. This one is shot. five hundred thousand dollars, and it's over. It's over. Po point of information, if I may, Councilwoman. Uh, <laughs> So it is a uh, $500,000 uh, commitment from Comcast right. to start and seed a digital alliance, right, which is to uh, reach out whatever the uh, makeup of, of the board shall be, right, to, to reach out to the communities right, and, and best you know, you know, partner with, with our libraries, partner with uh, uh, urban affairs, partner with you know, all these other groups that are in the city of Philadelphia that are dealing with, uh, let's just say partner with Internet Essentials, trying sure. to bridge that digital divide. But this fund is specifically to uh, address the digital literacy or issue lack in, or their lack of in the city of Philadelphia. And it's a one-time seed, and I think it's OIT, if I'm not mistaken, just from what I understand, it, they think that you know, they, it, it should be grow, it, they should grow, there should be a fundraising uh, component to it where not only should it start at 500000 it should get up to $5 million or $3 million with the tech community. So that's a Verizon. It could be a Google. It could be uh, any any of the uh, tech, uh, tech businesses that are in our central offices in the city of Philadelphia in which our communities uh, benefit from. So, okay. you know, they're I mean, it's that's why when they, when they talk about you know business being a part of it, right? But then you know proposals will, I'm sure will be put in front of them on where you know who receives grants and what communities and why and what are they going to do about sure. it and, and, and things like that. You know, so so council is is definitely going to be a part of uh, this conversation as we move forward for for that fund. I think right now it's like what partner or who can be brought in to raise the most amount of money. All right, to 
have the city receive the best benefit it possibly can in, in uh, uh, the lack of digital literacy, you know, because it's out there and it's out there in, in, in a big way, as, mm -hmm. as you well know, in, in all communities, sure. but in, especially maybe a little more in, in some of the uh, uh, in the poorer community, underserved sure. communities. Sure. So, so that's, that, that, that's with the intent of the of, of the, the, uh, of the fund. Is correct. Well, that clarity is important because seed is, it, it means it launches the effort. It doesn't mean that the effort goes away. Right, and that's not a part of it. it, it just you know, for the record, that is not part of the franchise agreement. I mean, this is outside the scope and aside and aside letter commitment uh, to the city of Philadelphia as you know, Comcast being a partner with the city. You know, as we went through that grueling process for 18 months, more intense over the last uh, six months, and it included all our partners from mobile media, from Philly Cam, and a lot of uh, Urban Affairs Coalition. So, it, you know, folks that were uh, beneficiaries of trying to uh, be a part of the Internet uh, mm -hmm. Essentials Program and, and serving our communities, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. I mean, so they are all just the examples of, of folks who are going to benefit from the digital literacy from okay. once, it's, once it's established and up all and right. running. Well, I appreciate that. So folks running STEM programs? especially STEM programs for girls, they need, I, one of my recommendations would be that, that they're on that, on that board. Because uh, we know girls lag far behind when it comes to science, technology, engineering, and math. And uh, that's an opportunity where we can move towards trying to equalize or level that playing field so that girls have a chance to move into that, that, that part of the world. Um, I, Philly, Philly Camp, for sure given who they are, what they do, and who they represent. Um, and my office, I'm sure, along with Councilman Gim's office, will also get a, a long list of uh, community organizations that are on the ground floor, entrenched in neighborhoods, uh, hungry for opportunities where they can make a difference in the lives of kids who otherwise wouldn't get it. Councilwoman, if I may, uh, since I've been deeply entrenched in the whole Comcast uh, process, uh, maybe we should pull together a little briefing just on the that would be on huge. the digital literacy, so we we understand what we're trying to uh, pull together and, and how we can uh, benefit and, and grow and accomplish what we're we're out to achieve. That would be huge. You bet. Thank you. Thank Chair you. recognizes Councilman again. Just, I just wanted to bring a little bit of clarity to it, and I appreciate Councilman Heenan's suggestion to bring together a group to, to talk with OIT about it. But in part, you know, I wanted to raise the consideration that um, the, the seed fund for the Digital Alliance Fund is meant to be that, you know, and that we have a lot of players who are, and, and big corporate entities who are generous and interested in this, but I separate the donations um, from the people who actually sit on the board, and that the importance of the board is that it's not, it can't be a token board. It's got to be a truly representative board in order for us to truly be serious about ending the, the you know, addressing digital literacy, and most importantly, ending the gap for our most vulnerable communities who, who frequently don't do that. And I guess I'm not sure that Google needs another place at the table. I'm not sure that, you know, um, some of our other biggest entities who are already here with us don't necessarily need to direct the, the direction of the funds. We need a big idea about how to think about the gap that we have in our city and in our country about uh, a digital access in general, and we want those folks to be on this uh, historic board. I think it'll be an important one. Um, I encourage OIT not just to come to City Council for individualized recommendations, but to think um, and invest very broadly in overall a commitment to inclusion and uh, vulnerable communities in OIT. I think that is a fundamental responsibility of your department, that I don't want it to be just rooted in, in techies and, and, you know, kind of people who have uh, technical knowledge, but don't understand that the whole purpose of this technology is to bring us a better life, to bring us a more equitable life, and especially to help those um, who are most vulnerable in our city, low income, uh, English language learners, our seniors, um, young people in our city, that they have to be brought into this. And so uh, it isn't just a conversation about the Digital Alliance Fund. It is a conversation a little bit about OIT and reorienting ourselves away from the separation between techies and equity and access in our city. So thank you, Councilman Heenan, for helping me very, very clarify well, that. Very well put, and, and thank you. Uh, I, unless there are any other questions from any members, 
uh, that happen to be here at this time. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. And I want to say a, a special thanks to our court reporter who has stayed uh, on an extended time. So thank you, thank you so much for your for your patience. Uh, there being none, uh, the committee will stand to recess until 6 p.m. today. At this time, we will recognize uh, we will reconvene at uh, Concilio, located at 141 East Hunting Park Avenue, Philadelphia 19124. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, Council.